Hello, ma'am. We are so glad to have you here with us today. Uh, so I would like to introduce our, you to your guests first. So I would like to begin by saying that uh, Ms. Prachi Mehta founded TAG to realize her passion for alternate dispute resolution and providing clients with a simple route to justice. She started her career more than 15 years ago in New York as a lawyer and quickly evolved to become a dispute settlement specialist. She has successfully mediated several matters in India and overseas. After graduating from St. Stephen's College, she studied law at the University of Delhi and the New York University. She is a Harvard Law School trained mediation and has also worked as a visiting researcher at the Stanford Law School to research and develop mechanisms for the Indian industries and companies to effectively use mediation for resolution of their disputes. She was awarded the prestigious title of Weinstein Jams Fellow in 2019 in recognition of her commitment to alternate dispute resolution to the constructive resolution of conflict internationally. Welcome, ma'am, to the interview today. We are so glad to have you here with us. Uh, so I would like to begin by asking you that in law school especially, we are trained to debate one side of the uh, argument or one party. What made you go into mediation, which actually is a solution where we come and uh, we give a solution to both the parties. We just don't argue for one party. Thank you, Apurva, for having me here and to the Youth Conflict Management for organizing this. So your question is very pertinent. You know, we are uh, lawyers are trained as people who combat. And uh, we also understand, but you know, when you go back to the jurisprudence of it all, we understand that conflict is inevitable. But yeah. what solution we take for it? Is it combat in the courtroom or is it another procedure which sort of aligns with our inner need of, you know, continuing the relationship, being less expensive, consuming less time? So just the whole package, which is more easy in today's life and that literally is mediation so despite the fact that you know lawyers are trained as people who want to combat for their personal gains there is also a very large part of our humane nature which we are trained in to be mediators and that's what mediation all is about so when you graduated law school what made you choose mediation as your profession eventually when litigation is a widely popular profession to choose in law? So, you know, I did not choose mediation when I graduated from law school, to be very honest. And it's a very, very rare choice, even in today's day and age. Yes. Um, so I was a litigating lawyer. I started my career as a litigation lawyer in New York. I was with Davis Polk at the time. And it was very interesting. I was really enjoying it. Uh, I wouldn't deny that. And I still do litigate on the site sometimes when the matter does require me to help them. Uh, but you know, along the way, there was a point in 2007 uh, when I moved to California and I was introduced to some very senior people at Jams there and uh, they their careers are mediation essentially, right? Uh, I was invited to shadow one of the mediations and it was an interesting procedure because I had never been involved in a mediation before. So that's how my mediation journey literally started with an invite to come and mediate, <laughs> uh, shadow mediate. So not even speak, just sit quietly to see what they're doing because I was very inquisitive about what's happening in the mediation space. Uh, but it was very interesting and it literally draws you in because what you realize is that all the time that you've been spending in the courtroom, can be half of it. You're still pretty much making the same amount of money and you can actually be resolving issues and people go back happy and with repaired relationships. So that's how I started into mediation. That's, that's really interesting to know because you were trained or you're told by your parents to go into something that's widely popular. They don't recognize mediation. To see someone who's successfully doing that, it does give you a lot of hope. Thank you. But in my case, I did have a parent who was pushing me to learn about mediation. <laughs> you know, I, you obviously know that my dad um, has been very popular in the field and he'd been doing yes. it a long time before I even became a lawyer. Uh, but that said, um, it was not a popular choice and I was not interested in it until I really learned what, you know, ignorance, you, that was, it was pure ignorance. Yes. So you realize what it is and the depths and the bounds of it, that's when you realize what you're yeah. missing 
Uh, so what are your thoughts on dispute resolution are life skills, this statement? Absolutely. So what are our few life skills that we absolutely need in life to uh, be, you know, a likable person, if I may say so, or to be able to go through life, uh, maintaining good relationships, having yes. a great communication, speech, yes. um, being able to command respect and being able to give it in equal measures and be desirable in society, empathy uh, towards others and towards your own self, very important towards your own self. And uh, these are the basic skills that a mediator also has. And these are the skills that you're essentially trained in. You need to be able to empathize with the party's situation. And I'm not saying one party versus the other party, both the parties equally, you know, because both are in dispute and they're both yeah. suffering. And you need to be able to communicate very well the whole art of, you know, um, being able to take from one room to the other what the person is negotiating and not being able to misuse the words. So those are all life skills. And yes, dispute resolution is a life skill. I don't want to combat with my uh, household people every time there is a issue over is to be cooked for dinner, right? So yes. if you take 10 steps forward, you have a mediator. Yes. So my next question is that um, I remember in an article I read uh, on implicit bias and mediator neutrality published by Baron Bench, you spoke about uh, techniques to remove implicit biases from a mediator's mind. Um, so the philosopher John Rawls proposes a similar theory, uh, the veil of ignorance to achieve moral justice. So it, he says that basically in a common law system, when you're trying to achieve what is the right thing to do or justice, you should cast upon yourself a veil of ignorance that removes all your biases and allows you to make judgment. But the biggest critique of his theory is that how do you do that? If you do that, are you going to be able to make the right judgment? Because in a society, your moral standards have to be in place with what the society is going through. Or you have to recognize what is the right thing to do in accordance to the time in the society. So what would you like to say about this? So two full things. His, uh, his statement is probably a little more applicable to a judge that he has to put on a veil of neutrality uh, versus a mediator where we are not passing a judgment. We are helping the parties achieve their own, uh, you know, their own resolution. You might be facilitating the process and at sometimes you might be evaluating the process also for them. But um, but the decision is their own and the resolution is their own and the proposals are their own, right? So in this case, I don't think a veil of neutrality would help. I think a if there has to be a twofold um, process for you to recognize your implicit biases as a mediator. And that is the number one fact is that you have to agree that you have implicit biases, you know, to yourself, not to others. But you have to agree to yourself that you have implicit biases and then work on finding what those are and resolving them. You wouldn't know yeah. what those are. You don't even know they exist because they're so deep seated in your uh, in your automatic responses and your subconscious yeah. you have to move beyond saying, oh, I'm completely neutral because I'm trained as a mediator to going to a place where you say, hang on, yeah, I'm trained as a mediator, but I'm a human at the end of the day. So what do I do to figure out what are my implicit biases even? So I would disagree having a veil of neutrality. I would agree more with the idea of uh, figuring out your implicit biases and taking steps to correct them in every situation. They will not go away. These are your yeah. natural nature, right? This mm -hmm. is how you grew up. You started forming them by the age of three. So you would have to work on them on every situation. So I will not be able to correct one implicit bias and just be done with it. I'll have to correct it every time I'm presented with a case which is of similar nature. So, so my next question would be that what has been your biggest experience in all these years uh, in mediation? So your I biggest would, learning experience, if I may say. So I would go back to this, figuring out that I was human and there were implicit biases. It was it was an eye opening experience. I experienced it in a very shocking manner during uh, en route to a mediation uh, settlement uh, meeting 
and you know you had a min a few minutes to figure out how you're going to deal with the situation where you are actually biased towards one party and against the other yeah. and so so yeah that has been the biggest learning sometimes you do realize them while you're sitting in the mediation meeting and you have to be sensitive enough to be able to appreciate that you have figured out a flaw in yourself so that to me has been the biggest learning um in this journey definitely so if if you had to tell the youth of his country today uh, the benefits of mediation what would you uh, tell them i would go back to your life skills and say that you know um, conflict is inevitable how we handle conflict is in our hands so if we can handle it in a way which is which is not going to lead to violence or bullying you know the youth world is a little different from our adult world and we sort of tend to forget how serious small things can also become small conflicts can also become they can be violence they can be bullying they can be assault so to figure out how you are going to end one conflict is up to you and how you handle it it is it is entirely your own doing and yes the other party has a right but you know nobody can keeps um keeps pushing somebody who's looking for a resolution so people push somebody who's either ignoring it and trying to think that it will get past them or they push somebody who's reacting or they push somebody who's just um not willing to engage so you have to overcome those hitches and those problems and you have to work towards a resolution and that actually does create a more peaceful socio economic political yes on a wider level but on your personal level it does create a more peaceful life and um, and you appreciate it more and more and more as you keep getting older every year but you have to start sowing the seeds when you're younger in your life yeah what do you think about a stand alone law for mediation in india as already exists in other jurisdictions uh so see in india we have mediation but it's in a piecemeal format we have it in mm. various platforms all over the place you know it's it's not there's no like governing statute for it we have our section 89 in the cpc where even the supreme court has given large decisions in the afghan infrastructure matter uh we have our uh, special ma- uh, we have a marriage act which calls for mediation we have a commercial court but the problem with having all of these piecemeal is that we need to have mediators who are trained in these specifically you know to be able to uh, deal with these specific issues then the other problem that comes is that these are not mandatory over overall so some of them make it mandatory some of them make it optional then we also don't have so we have a very heavy leaning towards court and ex mediation still which makes a mediation process very unprivate if i may say so you know you're mm-hmm. sitting with 10 20 sometimes 50 other people in the same waiting room for your family mm-hmm. dispute and you don't feel comfortable walking into that room and talking okay. about your personal issues right so if we have a mediation statute it actually governs all these laws on the top and it creates a forum where people can opt for mediation outside and have binding agreements which makes it a lot more um, a lot more achievable for the common person and you know it also brings in a very high element of confidentiality and privateness and you know uh, it just it just formalizes the whole system so from and i'm talking about very basic issues right now i mean we can go deeper into you know issues which are related to how the law has been framed and all these um, mm. piecemeal matter so from the point of view of these very basic issues itself we absolutely must have a statute which is paramount and on top of all these uh, to govern the mediation process and system and of course now we have signed the singapore convention so we are hoping and looking forward to a um stand alone statute in that respect definitely uh so as per your experience mediation is effective in which kind of cases i would say everything <laughs> uh so there are cases in which you mediate you cannot mediate right and uh, let me go through some of those first you can't mediate in matters 
which require an analysis or a question of law which needs to be determined by the court. Right? You can't do probate matters, you can't do criminal matters which are not compoundable and uh, collusio cases. So, you know, there are uh, there are matters which you can't mediate, but any civil matter which has an element of settlement uh, is something you can mediate. And our courts have over the years become very expert in determining those two. So if the parties are not aware of or the lawyers have not educated the parties, then uh, the courts do come up with the suggestion of mediation a fair amount of time. Is there a difference between how the two genders mediate or in their style of mediation in any way? No, I don't think it's gender driven. I um, I would say it's personality driven. So, you know, uh, you can have all sorts of personalities and you can have very similar personalities in two different genders. The process of mediation by itself is very structured. So you can't play much around with the process. However, the um, the communication skills which you use are very personal to your personality, right? So I think that's where the differentiation comes. I wouldn't say that one gender is. Um, so, you know, this is a very um, going back to uh, talking about the gender a little bit more. This is a very misconceived notion that um, oh, women are better for only, you know, matrimonial cases in uh, mediation or men should look at like commercial cases, which is not true. Most of the work that I'm doing actually does border on commercial a lot. So um, so I would say, yeah, no, no difference gender wise, maybe personality wise. OK, um, so do you think the youth of this country should be trained with conflict management skills? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, training youth in interpersonal conflict management is very important because um, of how you deal with conflict is all that determines the outcome of the conflict. The conflict by itself is neither good or bad. It's the outcome which you reach, depending on the process you use, which can make it look good or bad, right? It can be a negative outcome, a very positive outcome. So it's very important to train them in these interpersonal skills, which will automatically lead to them favoring dispute resolution. So, you know, um, techniques of handling conflict in a non-violent manner, such as mapping the minds and mapping um, of fears and being negotiate, being able to negotiate and mediate, those are very important. And in the long run, these youth can become the agents of our socio-political hmm. economic changes where the world becomes a little more peaceful because when they are given a conflict, they don't look at combat necessarily, yeah. they look at resolution. Yeah. Um, mediation is not being used uh, to its maximum potential in India. Um, can we change that in any way? Or what is the way to move forward from there? So I think the way to change anything, the paramount thing is education and awareness. So if we have education in our law schools on how this changes, if we have sp state sponsored um, uh, programs or, you know, talks or advertisements on how you can combat. So if you are driving around in our Delhi, so you would notice a lot of police stations have these hoardings where they say now come and resolve your dispute. You know, they all have this small mediation area where, you know, they'll help you first resolve your dispute. So, um, so those are the little things, you know, that in the long run will make a difference. And I think we just need to increase the number of them and the method of them and awareness and education and state interest are the paramount important things which will help uh, clear out all doubts about mediation and make it the most important way of resolving disputes. Definitely. So do you think the youth can bring a change in our country's dispute resolution culture where people are quick to take an adversarial approach? Then if yes, then how? Absolutely. Like I said, the interpersonal skills, uh, if they are taught those correctly, there is no way they don't become an agent of change. I mean, our history is evidence of so many things which started with the youth and, you know, became a part of normal life for all adults later on. So this is the youth is the generation which needs to be forward thinking mm -hmm. for the change to come. You guys are in law school and 
you know, you'll be stepping into the real world. If you do think of advising your client on mediation, then there's nothing stopping you. Definitely. Um, what is that one message that you want to uh, say to all young mediators and conflict managers out there who are aspiring to move forth in their career? Don't mediate until you're fully there because, <laughs> you know, um, a good judge, a good lawyer is not necessarily a good mediator. And only when you have shadowed and seen people who are in action, would you realize at least 100 times during a meeting, oh, I wouldn't have said it like this. I would have said it like this. But when you think like that, you also have to think, how would the party react? You have to form your words so neutrally and be able to present uh, each side very uh, matter of fact and, you know, um, still be able to empathize at the same time. So do go out there, put your egos aside, get those skills. I am still learning. I think every mediator is still learning. If somebody can say I'm the paramount, penultimate mediator really? of the world, then I'd be very surprised and I'd be very doubtful to go to that person. So yeah, don't don't let go of your skill set and keep yourself updated on things that change. So ma'am, a follow up question. Like you are a senior counsel as well as doing mediation on a regular basis. So if you have two appointments on one day, is it easy for you to make that switch in role where you're advocating for one party and then you go into a mediation appointment? Is it easy for you to do that or it takes a lot of effort for one person to do the two different things in one day? Oh, I've never thought of that that way. <laughs> but uh, but I guess um, it's not that hard. I mean, you know, we are very, um, human beings are very intelligent people. So once we train our minds to think in a specific way, and we know this is how we are going to think, we are very, um, very cookie cutter in our response then. So walking into a room where I'm advising as an advocate, which by the way happens on very rare occasions, uh, uh, is is not that tough anymore um, and going into the next room to mediate I think it, it becomes very seamless and I, I doubt you will notice that you're switching that much okay. but yes I may say so you will find the mediation one more pleasurable definitely how do you see ADR and mediation in particular in India growing in the next five years tremendously there's heavy state interest uh, there are lots of institutions like uh, the Delhi Dispute Resolution Society and a few others which have been able to institutionalize it very well. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen very heavy uh, or very well institutionalization privately and at, that needs a wider net and I think the crux of that would be the standalone statute for mediation that will be hopefully be out sometime soon. But the growth is tremendous. Uh, when I had started mediation in India, people used to confuse mediation with meditation. And that definitely has changed. So we've come a long way. You know, we've come a long way. And uh, people do call you on their own to say, can you mediate our matter? So, um, so I think the growth is tremendous. And mm -hmm. we are also looking forward to a very multi-layered and multi-growth factors in the next few years. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, ma'am, what would you like to say uh, to people who are looking for mediation internships? Because litigating internships are very easily available, whereas mediation internships aren't that easily available, nor are they uh, widely popular. Yes, that is true. So, mediation internships are available with some institutions like DTRS. And, uh, you know, you can always reach out to a mediator whose uh, work you like or who you might want to shadow. And uh, getting a shadow permission is not that tough. So most of the times the parties are quite forthcoming on it if they trust their mediator. And they will give a shadow permission uh, in writing. You have to take that in writing. And I think that's where the crux is. The mediation is a skill you absolutely need to read about. But... Even more than that practice, you know, just like our law, we learn in law school certain procedural things. 
But when we are in the courtroom, we learn how to actually implement that procedure. Yeah. So I would yeah. recommend anybody who wants to do a, a mediation internship should reach out to private mediators and request for shadowing opportunities. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good luck. Great. Thank talk. you. Take care. Thank you.